Our reading this morning is from 1 Samuel chapter 22, beginning in verse 6. Then Saul heard that David and the men who were with him had been discovered. Now Saul was sitting in Gibeah under the tamarisk tree on the height with his spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing around him. And Saul said to his servants who stood around him, Hear now, O Benjamites, will the son of Jesse also give to all of you fields and vineyards? Will he make you all commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds? For all of you have conspired against me, so that there is no one who discloses to me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. And there is none of you who is sorry for me or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in ambush as it is this day. And then Doeg the Edomite, who was standing by the servants of Saul, said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitu. He inquired of the Lord for him, gave him provisions, and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. Then the king sent someone to summon Ahimelech, the priest, the son of Ahitub, and all his father's household, the priests who were in Nob, and all of them came to the king. And Saul said, Listen now, son of Ahitub. And he answered, Here I am, my lord. And Saul then said to him, Why have you and the son of Jesse conspired against me, in that you have given him bread and a sword, and have inquired of God for him? so that he would rise up against me by lying in ambush as it is this day. Then Ahimelech answered the king and said, And who among all your servants is as faithful as David, even the king's son-in-law, who is captain over your guard and is honored in your house? Did I just begin to inquire of God for him today? Far be it from me. Do not let the king impute anything to his servant or to any of the household of my father. For your servant knows nothing at all of this whole affair. But the king said, You shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's household. And the king said to the guards who were attending him, Turn around and put the priests of the Lord to death, because their hand also is with David, and because they knew that he was fleeing and did not reveal it to me. But the servants of the king were not willing to put forth their hands to attack the priests of the Lord. Then the king said to Doeg, You turn around and attack the priests. And Doeg, the Edomite, turned around and attacked the priests. And he killed that day 85 men who wore the linen ephod. And he struck Nob, the city of the priests, with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and infants. Also oxen, donkeys, and sheep he struck with the edge of the sword. But one son of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Ebiathar, escaped and fled after David. And Ebiathar told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. Then David said to Ebiathar, I knew on that day when Doag the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have brought about the death of every person in your father's household. Stay with me. Do not be afraid, for he who seeks my life seeks your life, for you are safe with me. Let's turn back to that passage in 1 Samuel 22 is not a very uplifting text. There is something very wrong in Israel. And hopefully we can learn about how we can find something very right in our Lord. Let's pray together before we go to the text. Father, we thank you that we can stand forgiven at the cross, that we can know your amazing love that redeems us, that transforms us, that puts a hope before us. We pray that We'd be sanctified in your truth today, that we'd be humble, that we'd be hopeful. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. A man walks onto a school campus and starts shooting down people. A terrorist straps a bomb onto himself and goes into a busy marketplace to take out as many people as possible. Or a man like Saul, in our passage today, has a whole village of God's priests annihilated. Why? I might try and give various explanations, but I think it comes down to this question. In these people's lives, where is God? Where is a person's worship, their value, their treasure? I was reading an article recently. I was talking about the essence of evil, the essence of our sin, 
is when we prefer anything other than God. It comes from Romans 1 and throughout the Bible, really, where we see that what man does is exchange the worship of the Creator for the worship of things that are created. That's the essence of evil. That's the essence of your evil, your sin. It's under all the evil acts. You yell angrily at your spouse. You put your demands higher than God. Being selfish, greedy, and rude is because you prefer your own way of how life should work rather than God's. Being puffed up with pride that gloats over others or jealous over what others has. It says God's not at the center. Something else is. Those moments when we sin, when we commit evil in these ways, God's not our treasure. He's not our highest value. He's not more precious than whatever we're preferring in those moments. Why is it important for us to know this? We can easily look at the, the evil that's around us and outside of us, and we might think we're not so bad, but we can still be living with God-belittling attitudes that drive us. And because until we know and see that what we need is sin-forgiving, life-transforming grace from our Maker, and cling to Him by faith, then we might just find ourselves becoming hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. The deceitfulness that has something else other than God at the center of our lives. And not even know. See, that's what's happened in the life of Saul. So far in the narrative, we've already come to understand that Saul certainly isn't a man after God's own heart. He had some veneer of religion at some point. He talked of the things of God, but it wasn't the real thing. He lacked obedience. He lacked a heart to want to be pleasing to him. And that's why God told him that the kingdom was being torn from him. He was selected as a king because it was according to the people's desires, but not God's desire in terms of a heart that seeks to love and cherish him. And so God decided that the next king would be a man after his own heart, David. So Saul knew this, but he didn't accept it. He wants to cling to the authority, the kingdom that he thinks is his, and he tries to stop God's plan. He seeks to kill David. And having sown all these seeds of self-worship, it's led to self-protection and self-focus. And we see in this chapter the depth of Saul's opposition to God and really the opposite of what a king of Israel should be when he does this wicked slaughter of the priests of a whole village of Israel. This is the epitome of evil. And it's preferring self over God. There's where Saul is at. No taste for God. Not acting as God king. He, God's king. He is a bad king. But there's also a a contrast in our passage that's going on, and it's important to look at what's happening with David, who we'll see as we go through the end of the text, is beginning to act more and more like how God's king should. So we're going to look at the passage in two parts. The first is going to be the outworking of denying God, and then the outworking of aligning with God. Denying God and aligning with God. And through this, we will recognize some of the outworking that comes from the root of evil and hopefully we'll be able to look to the only remedy for our aligning with the good that we have in our God. So let's look first at the outworking of denying God. So last week, David's on the run. He's desperate and in danger. Yet God provided for him. He protected him. He's still in danger, and Saul's still intent on his murderous plans. So here we are in verse 6, and Saul is under a tamarisk tree. This is having his royal court, so to speak, and he's sitting in, with his spear in his hand, and he's not thinking about how he can rule the country better and how he can protect them against their enemies and 
the Philistines. Instead, he's consumed with David. When he hears about David being discovered, he just starts in on his servants. They're standing around him. Here now, O Benjamites, will the son of Jesse also give to all of you fields and vineyards? Will he make you all commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds? For all of you have conspired against me, so that there's no one who discloses to me what my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. And there's none of you who's sorry for me or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in ambush as it is this day. How do you respond to talk like that when someone just starts laying into you and accusing you of all these things? And how do you answer when someone says you're conspiring against me and they don't believe if you say you aren't and you say the opposite? What do you do? It's not a very easy situation. But what's Saul trying to do with this type of talk? There's a number of things going on here that just show the results of him being at the center instead of God being at the center. The first one we see is paranoia. If you look up the word paranoia, it has the sense of seeing supposed hostility of others against you. And sometimes that even progresses to acting out in aggressive acts and self-protection. Pretty much sounds like Saul... He's consumed with the thoughts that others are against him. He, he's not seeking to rule for God or, or finding his contentment in him. He, he just starts reading into other things, and he's on the self-protection agenda. He thinks Jonathan has encouraged David to ambush him. He says that a couple times there, but there's no indication that Jonathan had done anything like this. He accuses everyone of being part of this sinister plot against him. He's insecure. He should be. Because in reality, his kingdom is threatened, but it's, it's God who's already told him this. God's the one taking the kingdom from him due to his own sin. So what he's doing is, is fighting against the Lord who's in control by trying to take control for himself, trying to control everyone else. And so from that paranoia, we have manipulation. That's another way that you don't have God at the center is when you start manipulating we see here this huge pity party he's having for himself, just sulking through the whole thing. None of you are sorry for me. He's, he's manipulating with emotions. We've probably seen that enough. Where You express some hurt or sorrow, and what do you want people to do but to, to pander to your twisted sensitivities? And in a sense, it's, it's a way of blame shifting as well. I wouldn't be so angry or, or sad or upset if you weren't so bad or unfair or helping me out. I'm the victim here. That's what you do when you don't have your satisfaction and joy and peace in God. You, you try and find it in other things. You try and get it in whatever ways you can. So there's emotional ma manipulation, but he also tries to uh, manipulate by appealing to self interest of his servants. Did you notice verse 7 there how Saul addressed the servants as official as the men of Benjamin? So Saul is from the tribe of Benjamin and what he's basically done is given the positions of highest authority in his government to his kinsmen. kinsmen right? he's, he's exercising nepotism here. And he says, look, you, you got the son of Jesse here from the tribe of Judah. Do you think he's going to be passing out government jobs and perks like I've done and what I can do? Now he's basically saying, I've abused my power already. And, and if, if you got the benefits and you still want them, then you need to side with me. This is what bad kings do. And actually, the quote there of giving you fields and vineyards and commanders of thousands and hundreds, it's, it's practically a quote from Samuel's warning back in 1 Samuel chapter 8 when he told the people what the kings would be like when they appointed kings over themselves. The king would come and take and 
give to others in order to bolster his own power. And here, Saul's boasting about it. Well, the servants, we don't know what's going on in their head, but there's not a word from them. The, the, the silence is broken when a foreigner, Daog, the Edomite, speaks up. Do you remember Doeg? It was alluded to, just a brief mention back in chapter 21, and if this was having a music track with it when we went through 21, when it shifted to that one scene where he was there at the priests. When David was there, we would have heard a deep bass track of sinister music. It was foreshadowing. And now we have Doeg speaking up, this Edomite who's not a Jew, and he says, I, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nom and Ahimelech, and, and he inquired of the Lord for him and gave him provisions and gave him a sword of Goliath, the Philistine. Just listening to the language, it, it sounds pretty much like a, a milita military endeavor. He inquired, that's what you do when you go to battle. You inquire of the Lord. You get provisions, you get a sword. But Doeg doesn't say anything about how David said he was on a mission for the king or anything of the sort. Of course, if you're already paranoid, you hear this and it's case closed. That's all you need to hear. This is obviously a plot against me. And even worse, the whole, the whole priesthood must be a part of it. It's a conspiracy. This is far worse than I previously thought. We're all interpreters. We all interpret life through certain lens, understanding of things. What do we mean? We don't live life based on facts. As one author says, rather, we, we live life based on our interpretation of facts. We respond to life through these lenses. If we think someone is for us, that would be one lens. If we think they're against us, that's another lens. It may be true, it may not be true. That lens can be shaped by my own conscience, and my guilt, past relationships. If someone has an evil heart, and God's not at the center, then my lens isn't going to be shaped by God's love and beauty and promises. It won't be the lens through which I interpret the circumstances of life. I have to have some other lens. And so when I have another lens and bad news comes over something that, that is valuable to me, being in jeopardy, that something I worship, whether it's money or job or relationships, my hope can be easily dashed and despair and misery sets in. But if God is for me and I actually have a lens that his promises are true, regardless of what's going on outside of me, I can have a very different outlook. But Saul's lens is such that he knows God isn't for him. He knows he's going down. He doesn't know how. But that's his lens. And so he lashes out. He, he condemns the innocent. And so we see another outworking of the nine God. We had paranoia, manipulation, now injustice. Saul summons the priests to come, and they all seem to come willingly, unsuspectingly. But Saul, for his part, he assumes their guilt even going into that. Why have you and the son of Jesse conspired against me? He's already made his verdict, hasn't he? You've given him these things so that he would rise up against me by lying an ambush for me as it is this day. Not a helpful one to a helpful way to approach someone is just assuming their guilt, not giving them a chance to answer. But Ahimelech, for his part, gives an honorable response. He said, "What is all this conspiracy stuff? We're talking about David here. He's your servant. He's he's loyal. He's your son-in-law. He's captain of your bodyguard. He's highly respected in all your house. And this isn't out of the ordinary. He's done this before. He's come to inquire of me before. Man, I don't know what you're talking about." And Saul doesn't even seem to listen. 
He's not interested in hearing the truth. So he gives his verdict. You shall surely die, you and all your father's household. This is supposed to be Israel's king. You remember what a king was supposed to be like? A king was supposed to be one who had a copy of God's law for himself. He had written it out and he would study it and he, he would try and rule by the, the, the ways that God would have him rule. What about the part in the law where it says that no one shall be contemned except on the testimony of two or three witnesses? Or what about how a father won't be put to death for the sins of a son or a son won't be put to death for the sins of a father? And here we have a whole household. Or how about the fact that these are God's priests? These are the ones given by God to be intercessors on behalf of Israel to God. They're the ones who make sacrifices, who provide the means to point to God's forgiveness and atonement in life, pointing to the forgiveness of, in God's truth. Saul doesn't care anymore. That all goes out the window once you deny God and, and become your own standard. And so he wants vengeance. And that's another outworking of his evil. We have paranoia, manipulation, injustice, and vengeance. When you perceive that someone's getting in your way, and you have this type of life that's not centered on God, when you think you've been wrong, then others have to pay. You inflict harm on them. It's happened throughout history when you see tyrants and People who slaughter those who oppose them. This isn't because that others have broken God's law, not because there was a thus saith the Lord. It's because, as James 4 says, it was the desires of their heart. You desire and you don't have, so you murder. And we think that sounds harsh. Is that really why I, I quarrel? Are we really murdering? Well, it's the same sense of it, is that we have something else at the center, and it's the, our desires. And they're not aligned with God. And so you fight and quarrel. You see the essence of evil. They're preferring something other than God. So he wants vengeance, but even Saul's henchmen, they're... They're not willing to kill the priests. They apparently fear God more than they fear Saul. So Saul calls Doeg. He apparently has no fear of the Lord. You turn around and attack the priests. And Doeg turned around and he kills 85. 85 priests who wore the linen ephod, the priests of a, the garments of a priest. And then Beyond that, he goes and strikes the whole city of Nob and the priest with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children, infants, ox and donkey and sheep, all struck down with the edge of the sword. And Saul, in his own twisted thinking, believes this is justice. He allows the slaughter of a whole village of Israel. Instead of saving his people, he's destroying his people. It's a holy war against God's priest. And why do I use the term holy war? There's a, there's a terrible irony here. And just showing how far Saul has fallen. Do you remember when Saul was called to have a war against Agag, and the Amalekites, in chapter 15? And he was to go to them and spare nothing. But he wouldn't do it. He disobeyed God. And he spared the king, he spared the best of the livestock. But now, against his own people, he holds nothing back. Even God's own priests. He's treating God's people like the enemies should have been treated, but he wasn't willing to do before. It's really a holy war against God. Willing to, to wipe out the priesthood, wipe out the means of intercession with God. That the priesthood is how Israel remains Israel. But Saul doesn't care about that. Sin is a slippery slope. 
That's why Scripture warns about not being hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And it's all bad now. Saul's set himself up as the ultimate one to whom allegiance should be given, and he's set himself in the place of God. He's against God. He is anti-God. Or, since he's also against God's anointed one, David, and anointed one means Christ, he's also anti-Christ. Saul's an anti-Christ. It may sound like stark language, but we know Scripture warns us that there's been many antichrists, even as there's a final antichrist coming. First John chapter 2, verse 18, the antichrist is coming, and now many antichrists have already come. Saul's in a long line of antichrists. Those, as Psalm 2 said, who rage against the Lord's anointed. Even as it was predicted from the garden, that old serpent of old, who opposes the offspring, opposes the seed of the woman. There's been through history the characteristic of Antichrist who oppose and enter in conflict with and, and seek to crush God's people. It's ugly. It's sheer evil. But it all starts at the same place not having God at the center. So the Bible warns. Don't prefer anything over God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, not other things. And when we do, you have James in the same passage, chapter 4, saying, you adulteresses, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? If you want to be a friend of the world, you're making yourself an enemy with the God who made you. No, we, we're not to take sin lightly. Don't let your worship be merely external and play the hypocrite. Don't align with anti-God agendas and the values of a fallen world and harden yourself to not know when God's not at the center. We're not to be like in the time of the judges when everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Remember, that's how we started out first, Samuel. We're, we're coming out of this period where everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And there was no king in Israel. And now there's been a king and he does what's right in his own eyes. We looked for a king, but he wasn't the king to be. It's a dark passage, but we still see a bit of a silver lining at the end. As we'll look at the outworking of aligning with God. Our chapter ends with a contrast to Saul the destroyer and killer of the priesthood. As we see, David is the one who protects the priesthood. Verse 20, there's, there's, there's one son of Ahimelech who escaped Abiathar, and he fled to David. Abiathar, he, he told David what Saul had done, and he killed everyone, and, and, and David's sorrowful. He, he, he knew on that day when he saw Doeg there that he would tell Saul, not that he knew what would have happened out of it, but he mourns that I've brought about the death of every person in your father's household. But you stay with me. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. For he who seeks my life seeks yours, and you are safe with me. Let David have that confidence that he's safe. David as God's promises at the center. He knows he can be safe. But this is a significant statement here. There's a contrast between what David just said and what Saul has said earlier. Verse 16, Saul said to the priesthood, you shall surely die. And David says, you're safe with me. David is acting more like the true king. And we 
look at a passage like this, we need to understand that this isn't us about us being like David. This is about what it's like to be under God's anointed king. When he's living as he should. Here it's David, but it points to what a king should be. A picture that's ultimately fulfilled in Christ. It's a picture how God's Christ is to protect and serve his people. Serve the Lord's agenda. We see more going on here as well. We see how the priesthood is now with David. The priesthood, again, the, the means by which we have guidance, intercession with God. Chapter 23, this Abiathar, he brought an ephod with him. That's part of the means of inquiring of God. So now Saul has no guidance from God, and David has a priest of God. And as you saw back in chapter 5 last week, in chapter 22, he also has a prophet with him, a prophet of God, Gad. What's happening here is we're beginning to see a formation of a new kingdom. We have a prophet, we have a priest, we have David the king. And he's not alone anymore. He's got prophet and priest, even to himself, but he's also gathering a people to himself. David is, is welcoming the weary and the marginalized. Back in verse 2, those in distress and dead and, and discontented come. They were discontented with being under Saul. This is a pattern that finds parallels in the ministry of Jesus as he gathers people to himself. Jesus was the friend of sinners. His disciples, a bunch of nobodies, fishermen, traders, zealots. Like David, Jesus began with a rather motley crew. But like David, he and his people would be opposed by the world and opposed by Israel's leaders. But his kingdom is also centered on prophet, priest, of king, and king. It's all in him, though, is prophet, priest, and king. This is the beginning of a new kingdom and the people of God. And as Jesus has a similar cry to the marginalized, he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Jesus, like David, is saying, you're safe with me. You're safe with me. Now here's where we want to take some lessons on the outworking of being aligned with God and his king. Let me just list them first, and then we'll talk through them, and they all relate. The outworking of being aligned with God involves persecution and protection. An eternal perspective and providence. And let me talk about what I mean first. Persecution and protection. If you align with God, it's not going to be all rosy in this life. David's on the run for years. And Christ was despised by men. And those who follow Christ will be despised too, our Lord taught us. And that should make sense if we will understand the nature of this world that we live in. It flows naturally out of what we've seen of those who deny God, that they will oppress the people of God. We, we should expect it. There's two types of people in this world, those who worship the Lord and those who reject him. Those are the broad categories that Scripture lays out. And again, from the garden, there will be an opposition between the two. The righteous are made outcasts in a world of sin. And God's people experience the hatred of God's enemies. And so Jesus says, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. A servant's not greater than his master. But yet, in that fact, that fact of persecution, there's protection. A fascinating statement that Jesus makes in Luke chapter 21. And he's speaking to his disciples. 
And he says that all are going to be delivered up. Some of you will be put to death. You'll be hated by all for my name's sake. Yet not a hair on your head will perish. How can he say that? You might get killed, yet not a hair on your head will perish. And what he's saying is, yes, there will be persecution, but ultimately God's people will suffer no eternal spiritual harm. He's saying, with me, there's safety. And this ties into eternal perspective as well. We have to have an eternal perspective. If there's going to be persecution and yet protection, we have to put this in a bigger picture than just the here and now, don't we? Why else would anyone sign up with aligning with God if it brings suffering and opposition? I would only do that if I believe there is something more precious, more valuable, more eternally satisfying than align with, aligning with my temporary comfort or aligning with the world's ways. I'll only do it if I see that God is my treasure and that his steadfast love is greater than life, as the psalmist says. I think of another psalmist, Psalm 73. And he has this eternal perspective and he says, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart might fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Can we say that? There's nothing on earth that I desire besides you. See, aligning with God means I need to be connected to this eternal perspective. And seeing his eternal goodness, or, 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 or I won't align. Or, or when things get tough, I will trade him for something else. That almost happened to the psalmist of Psalm 73. He almost stumbled because he looked around at the world and he said, why do the wicked prosper? And here I'm trying to serve the Lord and, and, and hardship is coming. Not being treated well. But then he got an eternal perspective. He understood their end and his own end. And he had nothing in heaven but you. And there was nothing on earth that he desired more. So he grabbed on to that eternal perspective. And it gave him endurance. And this is, this is how we connect eternal perspective. We need to connect it to also... A trust in God's providence. So, meanwhile, meanwhile, if I trust in God's ultimate protection, if I have this eternal perspective, then meanwhile, I can trust in his ongoing providence, his, his sovereign control of this life now. That's our final outworking of aligning with God, is trusting in his providence what do we do when we see the wicked prosper or even acting against us now? What do we do when we see the evil that the Doegs enact? <clears throat> David had a chance to think about that too. Abiathar told David of the horrid slaughter at Noam. And it was a, it was a horrific Wickedness for which Saul and Doeg are fully responsible. Yet we shouldn't read about that slaughter without recalling the prophecy of 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 31 to 33, where God prophesied against the house of Eli for his sin, saying that your descendants shall die by the sword. You see, this wicked slaughter was a fulfillment of what God said would happen to the house of Eli. See, there's a tension here, isn't there? There's God who's sovereign over everything, yet we're still responsible. And, and yet he works all things according to the counsel of his will, it says in Ephesians 1.11. This is meant to be a great comfort. He's sovereign over the falling 
of a sparrow, the casting of lots, even the slaughter of his people. He's sovereign over your lower back pain. He's sovereign over your tax bill or a terrorist attack. Or Amos 3.6, does a disaster befall a city unless the Lord has done it? All things, good, bad, ugly, horrific, are ordained and guided and governed by the creator of the universe. And if we are aligned with God, you trust that even in the most wicked circumstances and acts, God is working it for good in his glory. And it might be hard for us to see. Actually, it's impossible for us to see. That's why we walk by faith, not by sight, because we we can't see that. But by faith, we know who this God is, who is in control. He's good. And this is where eternal perspective maps to our present endurance. We can endure because we know God's providence is all working out his plans, even in the most wicked acts. And we get insight into how David had hope, even in the midst of realizing this wickedness done by Saul and Doeg. We saw already in verse 22 how he felt sorrow for what happened, and that he even brought it about. But, but turn to Psalm 52. It was interesting to see how many psalms are referenced directly in this, these passages in 1 Samuel. And notice the superscript on Psalm 52. This is when David, he's reflecting on when Doeg had told Saul about what happened at the priest. And David acknowledges the evil. Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? In verse 2, your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor, O worker of deceit. You love evil more than good. He, he sees the character of Doeg here. Falsehood more than speaking what is right. You love all words that devour, O deceitful tongue. So he acknowledges the evil, but he understands the end but God will break you down forever. He will snatch you up and tear you away from your tent and uproot you from the land of the living. And so we can see that justice is going to be upheld, but then there's something that the righteous, they will see and fear and laugh at him. And they see the picture of someone who didn't have God at the center. Behold the man who would not make God his refuge. But he trusted in the abundance of riches and was strong in his evil desire. He did not have God at the center. Maybe the riches, maybe Saul gave him some of the reward as well. So I understand that there's, there's or the world out there that is not aligned with God and there's those who are. And he says, as for me, I'm like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the loving kindness of God forever and ever. Even in the midst of that wickedness, he's trusting in God's loving kindness. I will give thanks forever because you've done it. And I will wait on your name for it is good in the presence of your godly ones. He's got an eternal perspective. And it helps him to look at the tragedy of the existing circumstances and he trusts in God's forever loving kindness he knows that God's going to set things right and even through this evil David clings to the Lord verse 1 the steadfast love of God endures all the day and he ends up I will trust it forever evil acts can be used for good so we see all throughout the scriptures and even preached and, and prayed in the early church The most horrific act done by man in human history was crucifying the sinless Savior. Acts 2, 23, Peter preaches and said, You crucified and killed him. Lawless men crucified and killed the Savior. 
It was the greatest evil. Yet, God delivered him up according to his definite plan and foreknowledge. And that greatest evil accomplished the greatest good. What's that good? It's what we celebrate. The Lord's Supper. That he came to bring us back to God. He took the form of a servant to live the life that we couldn't live, to die the death that we deserve. He gave us forgiveness, justified us, the hope of resurrection bodies, but, but those were just, just part of it. The main goal, 1 Peter 3.18, was to bring us to God. The death on the cross, the, the forgiveness of sin, is just to remove what separates us from Him, that He could be at the center of our lives forever. And he loved us so that we might live for him and with him forever. To turn us from the essence of evil, to turn us from preferring anything else above him to being satisfied forever in him. And that's the essence of all good. But he calls us to himself to turn from God to nine ways daily and to look to him to find rest for your soul. And you are safe with him. And Father, help us to know that safety. Help us to know your grace. Not only the grace that forgives, but transforms, and the, the grace that puts before us eternity to shape our lives in light of it. Teach us to number our days and fix our hope once and for all in the grace being brought to us. When Christ comes again, let us live with that perspective. Encourage one another in the day by day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.